thank you everyone to come to this small talk and I hope everyone is going well. And uh, for people who are not know me, and my name is Yi Chao, and some people will pronounce my name as Yi Kao, uh, but my surname is Chao. It's very hard to pronounce in English. So um, my duty is uh, IT technical officer in the NYASRA, and I'm currently uh, managing the HPC cluster. And also now I provide the IT services to the staffs and students. So if you have anything related to the IT issues, you can contact me. So don't, don't be hesitant to do that. And today I will talk about some information about our current HPC cluster and try my best to give some tips and on how to use it more, effect more effectively. So I hope this can be helpful and can help you to use cluster more effectively. So here, here is the outline of the today's talk. So I will firstly talk about the architecture of the HPC, and then I will give brief introduction about how to access it. And I will also do a quick recap of some basic uh, Linux, uh, some Linux basics. I think it's uh, something that's important. And then I will introduce the Conda and how to use Conda with TensorFlow and R on our HPC. And the last part is I will briefly introduce the Slurm batch system and give some information about the external computing resources that are available to us. And here is the system diagram. So we run a HPC in a one gigabit local network and the HPC. I, I, think I, I think you forgot to share a screen. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, can everyone see me now? Yep, thank you. Okay, so I just restart from here. So this is the outline of today's talk. So basically there are six parts. And uh, the first part I would like to talk about is about the system diagram. So we currently run the HPC in a local one gigabit local network. The HPC is connected to the internet through a special public, uh, uh, public IP address. <laughs> And uh, this public IP address now is behind the UW firewall. And that's why you will need the VPN to connect to, connect to the HPC if you are outside the UW network. So the HPC cluster itself is consists of five servers at the moment. The hardware specification are different as well as the capacity due to, as Andrew mentioned, due to the age of the server. The head node has a 2.1 gigahertz Xeon CPU it only have six cores and providing 12 threads. So the memory is only 64 gig RAM and it has 500 gigabit SSD for system OS and H3 terabyte HDD for data storage. So the head nodes runs a variety of service and I will talk about it in the next slide. The head node is connected to the local network switch by teaming four uh, network adapter to provide the fast IO input to the four computer nodes. The CPU on, on the four computer nodes uh, all provide 684 threads. However, the CPU efficiency is different because of the age of the server. The node one, node two, and node three, they all, uh, they all have 256 gig, gigabit RAM and node four has 384 gig, Gigabit RAM, uh, gigabit RAM. However, the frequency of the memory is different. Node 3 and Node 4 are much faster than Node 1 and Node 2. The Node 3 and Node 4 uh, both have a GPU. On the Node 3, uh, uh, GeForce Titan 6, 6, gig, uh, 6, 6 gigabit GPU is available. And on Node 4, it has uh, Tesla V100 32 gigabit GPU, which is quite powerful. And we also have two UPS, uh, which can provide roughly half an hour power backup to the whole cluster in case a power shortage. We also use a remote backup PC and the UWS grid uh, to backup the whole system and the data. And uh, I will talk about the backup, uh, backup system later. And also as, as Andrew mentioned uh, recently, we we have got the mega application. So thanks to the Andrew, uh, Noah, David, Matt, uh, Ramesa, Pauline. Uh, I, 
I hope I don't, I don't miss anyone. Okay, let's look at the head note. Uh, there are a few services running on the head note. So the head note runs CentOS uh, 7 system. The reason to use CentOS 7 system is, is the system is quite stable and, had, and it has a great binary compatibility. So basically, uh, if the binary can work on the Red Hat or other Linux system, it can work on the CentOS. And for the connectivity, uh, oh. the head node provides the SSH for remote command line login. SFTP is available for file transfer and the X11 forwarding is enabled uh, on head node to uh, running the GUI application. We also have a CCAM asset repository running on a KVM virtual machine. So currently there are 42 data sets hosted on this repository. So if you want to publish your data set, you can just upload the data in, uh, into the CK. And if you click this link, it will, it will uh, bring, uh, bring the CK in your browser. And we also run our Apache 2 web server. Uh, the Apache server provides the interface you know, of changing password and also you know, it provides the file sharing through the HTTPS. Although it is a proxy server to the CCAN and RStudio server on the computer nodes. And also as mentioned in the previous slides, there are eight three terabyte ha uh, hard disk installed on the head nodes. These disks form a ZFS pool to provide the home and the data directory on the computer nodes by uh, net, uh, network file system NFS. Because we use software RAID, we actually only have 12 terabytes to use. The maximum disk speed is just 100 megabytes per second. I have to admit it is our bottleneck at the moment. So with the new node, we, we will have more storage. So hopefully uh, I can solve this bottleneck very soon. And note also manages the daily backup. Uh, via async and the FS uh, snapshot. I will talk about the backup system later. Uh, Headnote is also the DHCP server managing the local network. And also it acts as a control node of the slum system. And one thing I want to emphasize is please do not run simulation on the head node. Otherwise your process will be cleared automatically. Now let's look at the computer node. The computer nodes are mainly responsible for computing job. Uh, the SSH server is still running on them to provide the interactive logging, although X2Go is available for remote, uh, for remote uh, XFC desktop connection. The CUDA and the QDN library are provided for GPU work on node three and node four. Um, the Slurm computing daemon uh, on computer node will accept the job schedule from the head node to allocate the computing resource for slum jobs. Because, of, uh, because most of our users are, uh, are users, so we don't have a variety of software installed. So here is a list of the software that is available on the computer node. And uh, if you want to use MKR library, you can find it in the Intel Parallel Studio XE. So uh, on the HPC, users have access you know, to two di directories. One is the home directory. User can only use can only access their own home home di directory. Another one is the data directory. Data directory can be used you know, for uh, group projects. Everyone can access the data directory, but some subdirectory are only open to a specific group. You can request to create a group and a dedicated directory for your project if you like. And uh, here's some note I want to emphasize. So because uh, HPC is a shared resource and currently there's no resource limit in force, such as a storage, uh, storage size limit or CPU core limits. So when you use it, please do uh, keep in mind that the cluster is shared among multiple users. And again, uh, the physical limits at the moment is the maximum uh, data transfer between nodes is 480 megabytes per second, and the disk I/O is 100 meg megabyte, uh, meg megabytes per second. Okay, let's look at the backup system. Uh, for a cluster, backup is very important, but as mentioned, uh, we don't have 
unlimited uh, disk space. So, so to solve the backup issue, we have three layers of, of backup. Uh, daily backup is done by taking incremental ZFS snapshot. The snapshot are rotated every five days. A remote backup PC pulls the data from HPC weekly via rsync. This backup is a mirror of the HPC data at the time of, uh, of pulling the data. The HPC also use a clone to backup home and data directly fortnightly on UWS3 grid uh, using sync mode. Again, this is a mirror at the time of doing the backup. We have been allocated 100 terabyte quota on UWS3 grid, so upon request, Menu backup on S3 can be done uh, using an individual buckets. If you have such need, you, you just need to send a request to me and I can set it up, up uh, I can set up, set it up for you. Uh, because uh, UW IMTS recently implemented uh, the firewall to our public uh, IP address, so we will need to enable the VPN before you SSH, uh, SSH to the HPC. Uh, previously, we have old client called Global Protect, but this client will be uh, will stop work very soon. The current client is any connect. So, this if you click this link, it will bring you to the detailed instruction on how to set up the uh, any connect in uh, in your local machine with uh, multi multi function authentication. So how to log on to the HPC through the SSH? For Windows users, there are a few ways to do it. The easiest way is, is to use the party. Uh, this is a screenshot of the part, uh, party application. What you need to do is you just need to specify the URL of the HPC in the host name and uh, give the port uh, 22. And because at HPC, we are, we are cut the connection if, if there's no activity. So if you want to keep the connection, you need to go to the connection section and input the 240 uh, in this field uh, just to keep, keep the uh, session alive. Uh, there, there are another two ways. Uh, I personally using the Windows sub, uh, uh, sub Linux system together with uh, Windows Terminal. And another way is you can use the video uh, VCU Studio code. So I just show you how, how these two tools uh, looks like. Uh, just give me a second. So this is uh, Windows sub Linux systems and this, this is a Windows terminal. So in the Windows terminal, it, it provides a different prompt. So normally I use Ubuntu and uh, this is uh, when I log into the HPC. And uh, this is the Visual Studio. What you need to do is you just need to set up, set up the SSH client and you just connect to, for example, here, I just connect to the Nyasa HPC. It, it, it will generate a new window and bring me to my home directory. And here, here's an example. And this is studio code is quite nice because you can directly edit edit the file on the HPC. Uh, it's just just as you you edit some text on your local machine. So let me close these windows. And there are more instructions on how to set up these two systems. And if you go to these two links. And for the uh, Mac user and for the Linux, Linux user, uh, normally is you just use the terminal to connect to the, uh, to the HPC via the SSH command. So the command is just SSH with the username and with the uh, uh, URL of the HPC. Uh, although if you want to enable the X11 port forwarding to display the application on your local machine, I would recommend you to use dash Y option. Dash Y is the difference between the dash Y and dash, dash X is dash Y is trusted X11 forwarding. But for the Mac, you need to install the X course and for the Windows, you will need to install the X server. Now, if you click these two links, it will 
bring you to the software and you can find more information there. And for the Linux user, such as Ubuntu, you don't need to do anything because X server is natively, uh, is natively available on the Linux. So although SSH, SSH has a lot of settings, so I would recommend you to change the main page of SSH if you want to do some customizations. So when we log into the HPC, normally we will provide the password, but the password is very easy to be hacked by brute force attacking. Although on HPC, we have an application called fail, fail to ban to block such attacking, but I would recommend you to use SS keys to add extra security. To set up the SS, uh, SSH keys are very easy, just two steps. So the first step is to generate the SSH public and private key pairs using SSH key genes. And the second step is copy the public key to the remote, remote server using, command, using the command SSH copy ID. So it's just as simple as that. Uh, but there are some cut, uh, customization you can do, for example, like the in encryption, what kind of encryption you can do. So here's a two link. Uh, with uh, some detailed uh, instructions on how to do it on Windows and also how to do it on Linux and the Mac. As most of our users are R and R Studio user, the HPC cluster provides the R Studio server on the computer nodes. You can access R from your browser. One tip here is it's better not to disable the extension of the browser. I personally now have Temple Monkey on my Chrome, and sometimes it, it causes weird mouse issue when accessing the RStudio server. So this is a list uh, of the URL uh, which you can use to access the RStudio server. You just type in the URL, and it, it will pop up this, this window, and you type in your username and with password, and then you, you can sign in to, to the RStudio server on the computer node. And because RStudio server use HTTPS, you don't have to use VPN to access the RStudio server. Although I would recommend you to steer using the HP, uh, steer using the VPN. Uh, I would like to do some very simple recap of some uh, Linux basics. So the first thing I would like to mention is uh, HFS, Fire System Hierarchy Standard. Most Linux distros conform to this standard. The FHS defines the directory uh, structure and the contents you know, on the on the each directory. For example, here the etc directory contains a system-wide configuration file. The user lib and the lib uh, 64 contain uh, contains the dynam dynamic library for 32 bit or six, uh, 64 bit application that uh, that installed on the system. The USR include the directory have the head file. The USR local and the OPT are the places where you can find the third party applications. This information looks trivial, but it is important when you want to compile source codes to install some customized packages. I often face a situation is a user will ask me, I have error to compile a package. It has a warning about a missing library. Usually it is due to the incorrect setting of the path of the dependency. So if you know the FHS where you can solve such problems very quickly. And also many Linux tools and applications are also comply with FHS such as Conda and I will introduce it later. And you can see the main page of the hierarchy to gain more information about the FHS. And we, uh, as long as you know the FHS, so you know how to find, find the file or find the application one, but how the system knows where are those binary executables and where are the libraries, although how to manage the resources for different users to operate the systems. So to answer these questions, um, let's look at some, uh, some example of how the batch share environment is initialized during the login. The HPC use bash at default, but you can use other share program if you like. There are a few scripts involved in the, during, the initializing, uh, during the initialization when you log into the HPC. So first are uh, the system-wide configuration, which now applies to all the users. The profile under the ETC 
is a startup program to set some defaults. For example, the bash, also for example, the pass variable. Then some customized scripts under the profile.d directory perform some specific changes. For example, the path of the MKL libraries. These scripts are normally developed by the system administrator to customize the system for different requirements. Although because we use uh, bash as a default share, the bash RC under the ETC performs the initialization for bash environment. For example, the user mask and the prompt command. User normally don't have the privilege to change these system-wide configuration files, but user can still customize the environment to, to meet his need by modifying some configuration file in the user's home directory as shown here. The dot profile here, uh, we are not only applied to the bash, but also have the effect to the other shares. The other configuring files start with bash, are uh, specific for bash environment. The most important file would be the dot bash RC file here, in which you can customize all sorts of things like CUDA library paths, macro of the compiler and alias. This is important as many applications relying on setting the correct variables to work. Also, please be aware that the user, configuration, uh, the user configuration, configuration file here will overwrite the setting from the system configuration, config, uh, configuration files. So let me show you what, uh, what my uh, uh, .bus file looks like. So in my .bus file, I have a bunch of uh, alias and a bunch of setting. And this part is for the CUDA path. And this part specifies the compiler for the, for the TensorFlow. And also down here is the configuration for the Kona. Currently, I just dis disable them. And also there's other macro I defined. For example, this, is, this command is used to check the UPS uh, system. And this command is used to, to check the net, net, uh, net city, uh, to check the NFS systems. Okay, let's move to some very basic uh, Linux uh, command. Uh, many of you may already use them on your daily work. Uh, here, I want to draw your attention to some commands and options and that I think are quite useful. The first thing is the case sensitive. It looks trivial, but it is really important. For example, when you set a pass, a common mistake is to capitalize a letter especially when you have some auto-completion uh, auto enabled in your text editor. It's, it is a kind of problem you will easily ignore. And the next is the uh, directory navigation commands. CD is the most uh, essential command to navigation in the system. PWD is a command to show you current working paths and it is widely used in the script LS is to list the con uh, con uh, contents in the di directory. I personally use the dash ALTRH options, which means list all the files in a human readable long format in a time ascending order, including the file starting with the all, uh, with starting with the dot. So next is uh, di directory man uh, man 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 manipulation. So as we know, make DIR is used to create a directory or a sub directory. I like to use the dash P option, which will generate the parent parent directory if not exist. The LN is to generate the same link. It is quite useful if you want to use a, use a fire or directory in multiple places. You definitely don't want to create multiple copies as it will be difficult to keep all the copies synced. Although when generating the same link, you can either specify the relative path or, uh, or absolute path depending on your need. So for example, here I use uh, absolute path, but you can also use the relative, relative path by using dot dot. The other commands uh, like C, CP, copy fire, move, move fire, remove to delete fire. I personally like to enable the reverse by default, and especially when dealing with a large, large volume of, of the fire so I can see the progress. Uh, 
Although when, when you want to copy a directory, you also need to specify the dash R to do the recurs uh, recursive uh, copy. And here are some other useful commands I use daily. Ta with uh, option ZVC, uh, ZVCF is to generate a complex archive. And if you have some data you don't use frequently, I would, I would suggest you to compress them to save space on HPC. Gzip is to compress a file. Do is to show the disk space usage. You can specify the level of the report. For example, one here means just choose the first level of the sub directory. Cat is useful to quickly see a file content. Although Linux have uh, has a power, a very powerful tool called Pipe. It's like in the R, you can stitch multiple commands together, which is very versatile. The example here is to list all the netcdf4 files whose name contains the string 2015. Although the last command, the last command I want to mention is the history. Uh, bash will keep the record of the executed commands. You can use exclamation together with number to repeat a command. It is quite useful, especially for some very long command. Although here are two links which contain some information for more advanced command. Uh, if you want to use a Guardian on CI, I would recommend you to check the first link. The second link contains many commands for system diagnostic and tuning. If you are interested, you can have a look. Another task we often face is we need to transfer files between the local host and HPC. For command line tours, you can use SCP and rsync. The syntax are quite similar. You just type the command and then followed by the op option source destination and the tar target de destination. Here, here are some examples. This example here is to copy a file in the current directory on the local machine to your home, home directory on the HPC. The second example is to copy a, copy a directory because I specify the dash R here. The third example is to use async to copy a project, project directory on the HPC to the local uh, project directory. This command performs the archive because I use dash R option here, although I enable the reverse to see the whole, to see the whole progress. Async is quite uh, versatile and there are many options available. Uh, I would recommend you to check the main page of the async. And there are many options to control the copy behavior, like if you, want, uh, if you don't want to copy the, the same link or if you want to exclude some directory or file when copying the file. And although if you often need to perform copy on a specific, on a specific location, I, I, would, I would suggest you to generate an alias in the .bash RC file for your convenience. And if you prefer the GUI interface, I recommend the FireZilla. You just need to set, a, set up the HPC site by creating a new site and give the URL of the HPC and give your use, uh, username and a password and choose the SFTP protocol and click connect and that's all done. And here I will show you what it looks like after connection. After connection, Right, uh, left side, you will see your local uh, local path, and the right side, uh, right side is a is a remote site. When you want to copy a file, you just need to drag and drop like here. I just need to drag here, and let's start. And that's all for the Linux uh, recap. Uh, but for the Windows Windows user, I do have a extra note. Uh, because Windows use different char character uh, encoding, especially for the new line. So if you create a file on Windows and copy it to Linux, sometimes you will get a bizarre error talking about uh, some, uh, 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 some un unrecognized character. So there are two tools available to solve uh, this issue. One is a file, which can check the file type. Another one is a DOS, uh, DOS to Unix. It will convert the format from Windows to Linux to avoid such problems. Now let's move to the conda. So the first question 
is what is Conda? You may already use Conda to manage some open source package or have a dedicated Conda environment for developing a project. Overall, Conda, from my, from my point of view, Conda is a management system for package, for package and also for environment. You can use it for any program language, not just for, for Python or R. There are, there are mainly two, dis, two distributions, Anaconda and Minconda. Anaconda is a data science platform. Uh, it already has a lot of pre-installed package. Miniconda is a minimum installer uh, that only come with some essential packages like PIP and ZLab. Uh, here I provide two links uh, for the installation method. There's only a, a, slight, a slightly difference. And we use the Miniconda on the HPC. Uh, here's an extra, uh, here, here is an extra tip. If you, if you install the Miniconda in your own system and you can't find it, so you will need to set, set the path, path environment variable to including the conda being passed. Otherwise, you can't use conda. So why do we need conda? There are the other tools for packages and the environment management, such as module and docker. Um, the first reason I would say is conda is completely independent of, of the system library or admin privileges. A user doesn't need elevated rights to install packages or create an environment like Docker. You can also have different Conda environment for different projects. And the different Conda environment, they won't influence each other and they are very easy to manage. It also solves the headache of the dependency issues. Although Conda has different channels, which provides thousands of packages, Users can fully control the installation and you don't need to ask system, uh, system admin uh, to do it. It also is a great tool for collaboration. You can easily share the environment to your colleagues to have the same development environment. To create a Conda environment is quite easy. Uh, here's an example of creating an environment with the latest R and the session R package. The first example here is I use I use conda create and use dash n to specify uh, environment name r dash test dash nth. And also I use dash c to specify three channels to ask conda to retrieve the package uh, from these three channels. And I also installed i essential package and with the r based packages. Although I specify the three channels here, but conda will search the channel in sequence. Basically, the priority of, of the Conda Forge is, uh, is higher than BioConda and, uh, and higher than the defaults. The second example here is I created the same uh, environment, but instead in, uh, install the Conda environment into the default location in the home directory. I just specify the location using the dash p. This is quite useful uh, if you want to create a Conda environment for a project. One benefit is once you create the Conda environment in a project and you copy the whole project into another system, you transfer the Conda environment at the same time and you can use the same Conda environment in another system uh, right away. And you don't need to do the extra setup. So after creating the Conda environment, uh, it's quite easy to use the environment. Uh, Conda has a bunch of uh, command available for uh, environment uh, management. The first thing is uh, Conda info with a dash E option. It can be used to list the available Conda environment as a screenshot, uh, as a screenshot shown here. These are the envi uh, environment av available to me in the HPC. And you can use Conda activate uh, with the environment name to activate the environment. After you activate the environment, you will see a change in your dash prompt. You will see the name before your prompt, and it indicates you are inside a Conda environment. And if you want to quit a Conda environment, Conda environment, you just need to type the Conda de deactivate. Uh, deactivate. Conda makes it very easy to use. Um, 
but Conda is not perfect. One common error is conflicts when using different channels. To minimize such error, here is a recommended configuration for Conda. Basically, is to add the Conda for each channel and set the priority to restrict. This will force a Conda to search packages in the Conda Forge repository only. There are also many other configurations available, such as setting the threads for the Conda, and you can check this document, uh, this documents here for more details. And sometimes you may need to add a new package into a Conda environment over time. You can use Conda install to install the new package by providing the package name. This example here is I installed the latest TensorFlow CPU version into the R testing EMV environment uh, created before. Or if you are already inside that environment, you, you don't need to specify the environment name and you just need to specify the package name. Although you can specify the version you want to install. And if you want to install multiple packages at the same time, it's better to use the package list file. Like the example here, after create a, a Conda environment, and I just enter this environment and uh, specify the package list to install a bunch of packages. A package list file will be look like this. In the list file, you just specify the name of package you want to install, and you can also specify the version you want. And if you don't, if you don't specify a version, Conda will, will install the latest version for you. Uh, you can check more install options at these documents here. To share a Conda environment is really simple. You just need to export an environment, for, uh, an environment file, and this file can be used to replicate the same environment with the same packages. For example, here, I just use Conda and export and give the name of the of an environment name and output the environment file to this file. And to replicate this environment, you just use Conda and create and give a name and specify which environment file you want to use. Although sometimes you may want to check the installed packages inside an environment and export the package list, you can use Conda list, but uh, one, one note here is Conda list won't list the packages that were installed by the pip install. And you can see more about the, um, how to manage the Conda environment by following uh, these doc uh, this documents here. Conda, Conda is a good solution, but it is not a solution once for all. Here are some suggestions when I, when I was working with the Conda. The first is don't use one Conda environment for all projects. It will make very hard to manage the environment and upgrade the package if necessary. For example, the speed to perform a Conda command will be very slow, although the environment may corrupt very easily. PIP is also available in the Conda environment to install the package, as the Conda was originally designed for Python, but it is not recommended to mix Conda install and PIP install. The Conda won't know the packages that are installed by the pip install. So once you have uh, once you have some conflicts occurred, it is very hard to resolve. And also, uh, keep an environment file is a good practice in, uh, because it is useful when cor corruption happens. Install uh, an, uh, Another very important suggestion is I would recommend you to install all packages when creating an environment using an environment file to minimize the package conflicts. And don't upgrade the Conda environment if it is working well. Instead, please create a new environment. Although it's, it is a good practice to keep environment file updated when you update an environment file, or when you update the environment. And if you work with multiple versions of a package, uh, I would suggest you to use Conda search to check the package information before the installation. So before talking about using Conda for TensorFlow and GPU, I want to show you a simple example here to explain why using GPU is a good, good idea for, for spinning up. Although I already have many parallel packages and libraries for, for, for speeding up, 
The answer is GPU is quite easy to use and GPU is much faster than CPU, especially for the matrix operation. This example here is a simple comparison uh, when performing the matrix uh, multiplications. Metric, uh, metric A and metric B are two large metrics. The first part here is to perform the matrix uh, ma ma multiplication using a normal way. I use open plus when running this simple, simple example. The second part uh, multiplies these two matrices are using TensorFlow and the computation that is done on node four GPU. As you can see here, the GPU computation is 10 times faster than the CPU. So to install the TensorFlow with Conda on HPC is, is quite easy, especially if you only work with a single version of TensorFlow. There's only three commands you need, you, you, you need to run. The first is you install the TensorFlow R package. This is not TensorFlow itself, but it is a R package to, in, in, to interface the TensorFlow. Second is to load the TensorFlow R package and run in, uh, in, install TensorFlow to install the desired version of TensorFlow. There's a bunch of options here. Uh, here I would suggest uh, you need to specify the version of the Python you want to use in that environment. And also uh, you, you can check this side here to see the compatibility of the TensorFlow and Python and CUDA. There's a more setting you can find by following this link here. A real case uh, I was facing is some user may need to work with different version of TensorFlow. For example, a package was developed using TensorFlow 1.2 and you have another project using the latest TensorFlow. And I found it, it is quite difficult to use the R reticulate, which is a default a TensorFlow uh, Conda environment to interface multiple version of TensorFlow. I recommend it to use the system mini Conda to install the different version of, uh, of TensorFlow into the different Conda environment. This example here is I created a Conda environment called TFV1-12 and install the CUDN7 and CUDA29 and TensorFlow 1.12 into it. I also install the GCC com uh, compiler 7.3 uh, into this uh, environment. And I also create create another environment called the TFV2 with the latest version of the TensorFlow GPU. Because uh, the HPC uh, has, has CUDN and the CUDA toolkits installed in the user local, uh, but we only keep four versions. The four versions are 10, 10 10.0, 10.1, 10.2, and 10.11. So if you are using those four versions, so you don't, you don't need to install the uh, CUDN and CUDA inside the uh, CUDA environment. You just need to set up, set up the environment variable in order to use this, in order to use those libraries. So here's, here's a detailed instruction on how to do that. Once you have uh, multiple uh, TensorFlow in different CUDA environment, uh, and you need to choose different different TensorFlow uh, for different case, there's a two way to do it. The method one is you can set the system variable reticulate underscore Python, uh, pointing to the Python in the desired environment. For example, here, I set this variable pointing to the TFV1 12 uh, environment. Uh, and the second method is to use the reticulate function, use conda then. Uh, but remember, you need to set the required to be true. Otherwise, it won't uh, load the right, right, right Python version. Although I would recommend you to use the, the py config to check if the right, 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 right person, uh, if the right Python is loaded before you run your script. Now let's move to the Slurm system. Uh, as mentioned in the service on the HPC, we, we have Slurm installed on the cluster. So if you want to use multiple nodes on the HPC at the same time, you can sub submit a Slurm job on the head node. The Slurm control daemon will orchestrate the jobs with the Slurm daemon on the computing nodes to allocate the computer resource for the job. 
there are a few uh, Slurm commands to help running the job. The most useful command for users are sq, sync4, sbash, srun, and scancel. Slurm is quite, quite sophisticated and it has, a, it has been widely used in the HPC and cloud. I would recommend you to check the reference here. It will give you some example, um, more detailed setting, and uh, some uh, detailed explanation about all sorts of uh, commands. So here I will talk about a simple Slurm script to submit a job on the head note. A Slurm script is a bash script with Slurm directory specified at the, at the very beginning. So this directory start with uh, uh, pound sign and with the keywords, uh, keyword as bash. So this script here, I require 12 CPU and I require two nodes in the all, all nodes partitions. And the job name is to set to the my test. And uh, this job will send the email at the end uh, to my email address. And uh, this script is to uh, run a simple R script through the S run. The output is, re is redirected to a log file with a job ID. So on the HPC, actually, we have, if you type the S info, so you can see we have four, part uh, four part part uh, partitions available. The first is node four, it's dedicated for, for the node four, and node three and four indicates the GPU, uh, GPU part uh, partition. And all nodes, including all the computer nodes, and node one, two is just for the node one and node two. So you can submit your job to the different partition based on your needs. Sorry. And although when you assign the, the number of the CPU call, uh, according to the under law, it is not always the more the better. So I would recommend you to do a small trial uh, to get an optimized number for CPU calls. Uh, all HPC is a small cluster and uh, it's suitable for prototype development and running small scale experiment. If you want to run a large scale experiment, there are a few external resources you can apply for. Uh, one is uh, NCA Gadi, another one is Ma uh, Massive. Uh, UW has a partnership with them. Uh, if you want to gain the access to this system, you will need to apply through the National Compu uh, Com Computational Merit uh, Allocation Scheme. The 2022 20 round has opened since the August 18 and we are closed on the 5th of the October. There are two resources you can get help. Uh, one thing is you can create a project plan on the red box. The red box team will help uh, to allocate the external resource if you put a request on the plan. This is not only for the staff, but also uh, for the HDR student. You can also send a request to the HPC admin uh, mailing address. UW has a HPC committee and they can help with the application. And the merit schemes can be uh, competitive. So instead, you can apply for the Google Cloud Platform research, uh, research credits, but there's a few restrictions here. So it only provides 5,000 credits for a research project and only valid for one year. Or, and also for a research student, uh, you can only get 1,000 credits and valid for six months and only one award per research and per project. But one benefit is you only need to write a 250 words proposal and Google accepts the application on an ongoing basis. So they will make decision very quick. Normally it's just four or six weeks. Although MTS has a special discount with GCP. So you can contact the Craig Muller for details. And if you want to contact the Google, uh, here is the contact. Uh, here is the Google contact. You can send your your question to Ray. Uh, he's happy to help. And here's a reference. And uh, that's all. And thank you very much.